Welcome to the Odd Frog Chop Shop, your one-stop podcast for all things toy, design, collectible, comic book, video game, movies, pop culture, and more. And now, please welcome your hosts, Kelly Greenwood and Eddie Eremosio. It is our privilege and honor to welcome two very talented individuals to the Chop Shop today. We welcome Chris Allen and Paul Castiglia. Paul and Chris attended the School of Visual Arts together and later both worked on the staff at Archie Comics. Paul is a veteran comic book writer and editor who's done work for several companies, including DC, Dark Horse, and Archie, where he wrote comics starring the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Sonic the Hedgehog, as well as the comic book adaptation of Archie's Weird Mysteries, among others. He's also an animation writer who has scripted YouTube animated shorts, including Thomas the Train and upcoming episodes of Coco Talk. He's a published songwriter, film, and pop culture historian and author, and a marketing copywriter for toy companies, including Mattel, Razor Scooters, Moose, and more. Chris is an amazing graphic designer and illustrator who's been drawing for his whole life and professionally for about 30 years. He's probably most well known for the work he did on the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles adventures in the 90s. When I asked Chris for a bit of a bio, here's what he sent me. Bitten in his teens by a radioactive sloth, Chris Allen gained all the speed and motivation of the animal. He knew that with great laziness comes great irresponsibility. So he became an artist. Chris is an accomplished illustrator, both traditional and digital with a 30-year career spanning comics, package design, advertising, and production. He is apparently quite well regarded in the former Soviet Union as well. Chris lives in Hatfield with his wife, a few kids, and a bunch of dogs. And he likes wine. Paul Castiglia and Chris Allen, welcome to the Odd Frog Chop Shop. Thank you so hey, much. Hey, thanks for having us, guys. <laughs> this is super exciting. Thanks oh, for doing bravo. this with us, guys. So just a real quick uh, update for everybody. I'm... Kelly Greenwood, co-founder of Odd Frog Entertainment. That's my uh, partner, Eddie Aramasio. And today we are lucky enough to have Paul and Chris with us, who worked on the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, obviously. And uh, I think we'll just start off by asking you guys some questions about turtles, the comic book industry, and writing and illustration in general. So my first question is for you, Paul. Um, When did you first realize you wanted to be a writer? When I realized I couldn't draw well enough <laughs> in the comic book industry. Uh, you know, when I graduated school of visual arts, I realized I didn't have composition uh, anatomy or perspective down uh, as well as I would need to to compete. But literally, it's actually the truth. It sounds funny, but it's the truth. I realized I, I wasn't going to be able to compete with my fellow graduates, so I had to quickly come up with a plan B, and I put together a portfolio of picture strips. You know, I just kind of drew them thumbnails out of comic stories. And that's how I ended up getting work. I ended up first uh, freelancing for DC Comics. And then I got a staff position at Archie Comics uh, in January 1990, and where I uh, discovered to my great delight that uh, my friend and, uh, you know, fellow uh, collegian, he was actually a year ahead of me, uh, Chris Allen was working on staff there. So we kind of um, rekindled our um, our, our wacky bromance or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> well, it's bromance. More like uh, buffoonery. And, uh, you know, we went off to the races from there. But, yeah, that's that's, a- that's how I started. I started because uh, I just wanted to tell stories. And I always was into it. I always loved animation. I always loved comic books and storytelling. And I, I had to be – I couldn't do anything else. If, if you were interviewing me now and there wasn't such a thing as comic books and animation and toys – I'd be, you know, wearing nothing but a barrel around me. It's really <laughs> all I can do. So, so fortunately, it all worked out. That is awesome. wildly awesome. untrue, Paul, because Paul has <laughs> such a drive. Like, Paul, you could, Paul, you could just squeeze water out of a rock. I know. I'm just like, you would, if there were no comics you would be doing something else and you would be great at it because you just never, ever, ever stop. I'm well, very okay. impressed. I'm very impressed with Paul. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. I don't, <laughs> this will I don't be, know what to say to that. I don't, given the chance, this could turn into a real Paul it, love fest. Good. I'm a big fan. <laughs> <laughs> big fan of Paul here. Yeah. That being said, Chris, 
when did you start illustrating? Um, ever, forever. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, uh, I've literally been drawing as long as I can remember. Um, my, my father and my brothers were, were, um, illustrators, but never professionally. And, um, uh, it was just, it was a foregone conclusion that I was going to go somehow, um, uh, uh, do something as a professional artist. I've always wanted to draw comics. Um, eh, sort of until I did. And then I realized that, and I don't know, I don't know what we came here to hear, but I will say until I learned what really kind of a soul crushing industry it is. And (laughs) it was, I I had a lot of fun at the time doing it, but, um, I was not sad to put it behind me, but I mean, happy to talk about the the time when I was there. (laughs) Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, that was just kind of, that's a good segue to a question that just kind of popped into my head for you, Chris. Um, like from a, uh, you said you've been drawing for as long as you can remember. So as like, as the career path, was illustrator or comic book artist was that what you wanted to do and then you just you know went full speed at it and tried yes. to to accomplish that yes and 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 paul spoke about um uh the rude awakening that uh school uh gave to him uh why he wanted oh, to, yes. to writing um yeah remember that we were um yeah, class of 87 and uh trying to um you know, let's see if we could break into comics at a time when everything was like Rob Liefeld, muscles and pockets. And, and, um, that was never my style. Uh, right, right. I, I believe that the industry is much more, be much more for, can we throw some of style his style now. up there for us, Mikey? Some of his, for his, sure. His... For sure. Sure. So, sorry to keep going. Keep going. No, 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 you no, got, no keep talking. On. Um, so I wasn't really sure what I was going to do, but then, um, the staff position opened at Archie and that was, again, that was a goal. That was a golden opportunity. Um, because, you know, they were doing kind of cutesy stuff and, um, we landed there and, um, we could, I was, uh, had an opportunity to do, uh, to sort of prove myself doing art touch-ups and, um, corrections. Um, okay. did a little story here and there Did some little, the little Archie stuff. Well, Archie was a, a big deal. It was kind of one of those things where we both got to kind of show our skills a bit, and especially Chris. And, yep. And, uh, and little Archie, just uh, for the viewers out there, um, Archie had done since the 1950s uh, a younger version of the character. The typical Archie is teenagers, right? Mm-hmm. But they had a younger version called Little Archie that used to go off on all sorts of adventures. And there were a couple of great cartoonists used to write and draw them, Bob Bowling and Dexter Bob Taylor for, for many years. And, and Bob Bowling is, uh, I think he's still with us. And, um, you know, great stuff. But then uh, in the early 90s, Archie said, you know, what can we do to freshen it up? And there, somebody must have seen Calvin and Hobbes. And said, oh. Why don't we try to do a Calvin and Hobbes? I was, I, I think I was. The one who was saying like like Calvin Hobbes, we we could we should do like more of like that feel like more of take like, an influence from Calvin and yeah, Hobbes yeah and exactly and then into once Archie, they yeah. put Chris on the book it started out with a bunch of different artists on it but once they put Chris on it, it kind of went into hyperdrive and I think some of the stuff that was happening for some of us at Archie like Chris and myself is like once we were able to dig in and get some stuff going uh, because we enjoyed doing it and we and we would do it actually produce uh after a while they weren't really like monitoring what we're, what we're okay doing that's so good much. that that kind of they leads never to, they uh, never monitored us they never monitored yeah us. yeah so that as long, long as you guys to... produced you guys yes. were able to just do whatever so okay that's a good segue to the yeah, question so, like so, what is your process yeah. like when when you guys decide to illustrate or decide to draw something what what's what's how do you guys go about starting that especially with illustration yep yeah that's a bob bowling cover yep I should send you a, a one of Chris's pictures. little Archie. Yeah. I think Let there was one in our uh, in our chat, in our Team Odd Frog chat. If you can find that, right, my, a little Archie. You guys keep talking. Pages. <laughs> okay, so, yeah, but, keep, um, professional podcast. Keep yeah, talking. <laughs> uh, Chris, Chris, go into your process for doing artwork. 
yeah so yeah, that's um what... the the process is always different depending on who you're you're working with um like uh i remember the archie scripts were very uh um were almost like storyboarded out already um uh and what was it uh paul you'd be able to give me the names of more of the writers um but uh they would actually the script sometimes would be like almost like thumbnailed out per page um depending on the writer sometimes the writers would be um uh page two four panels panel one this happens you know making it a lot easier to illustrate yeah <laughs> maybe not yes and no um I mean that was that was the way that Archie did, and and we can get more into the turtles later. But when I okay. was working on the turtles with Murph, the first scripts came that way at the beginning. But uh, Murph at the time, I think, was being pulled in so many different directions that, and as we started working more comfortably together, he knew that he could just send me a rough outline, and then I mm-hmm. couldn't decide what was going, how the action was going to be broken down on the page. Um, uh, sometimes I've got uh, two pages fight, and I'm like, okay, uh, I guess we're making a fight for two pages, and then, and then That's I would cool. sometimes uh, write dialogue in on the margins and send it back to him, and then he would dialogue things out like that. But there was much more of a collaborative effort, and I was working with Murph at the time than than with uh, than with the Archie books. With but the Archie we would book. always um, pencil them in, um, tight pencil, or and then hand that off. And back in the day when everything was hand inked by Mr. Bill Yoshida, um, for the most part, uh, then he would uh, ink right, letter right onto the pencil pages and the handles off to the inker. Um, so that's, that's amazing. Yeah. 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 There were big sheets, right? Like 10 by 13 or something like that. Yeah. That's, that's how they did them back then. Uh, they would stat them down. But oh my God, the stat machine! Yeah, yeah, they wanted to make sure that all the detail was there, so you drew so, it big, right? And then, and then the letter would letter it, and then it would go to the inker, and yeah, and shrink them down. Have, I still have some of those pages. I still have the uh, blank artwork in my cabinet. I still have I still have Mirage blank pages that I, nice. I, I, I I'm hoarding. Uh, uh, I don't know why I'm hoarding it. It's just like I'm sa- It's like that bottle of champagne you're saving for the special occasion that you never open. <laughs> I just I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you start, like, I guess to take it to a technical aspect, do you start with like, you know, uh, a, like a basic shapes, or is it more like a loose hand sketch, or do you kind of visualize it first and then just? Um, when I was when I'm working on a page, um, I have a pretty good idea of of what there it is of what the page is gonna look like i mean i Mm. I, um i have an idea of how many panels it's going to be so i think the first thing i do is i'll 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 lay the panels out and then yeah i will do a quick thumbnail uh just to get the action down for each one and then go back in and um and uh uh uh, tighten it up as i go i'm always try to be cognizant of the order in which the dialogue is going to be delivered. So if you have somebody that's going to speak first, make sure you put them on the left side and things like that, you know, um, the layout we doing, of it. uh, again, I'm going to be jumping all over the place, but when we just did the forever war recently, that went back to, um, uh, the old script style, because that script was, um, very buttoned up and finished when I got it. And, so I knew how many panels were going to be on each one and who was going to say what when. So it was easier to just lay it out, bam. And uh, and that was all done digitally. Although still mm-hmm. actually at the 11, what, 11 by 14 size, I still did it at that same size at 300 DPI. And then they could shrink that down. That's a... Uh... I work digitally a lot for illustration, like Photoshop, and I've even used like um, Manga yeah, Studios, yeah. I think it was called. So I was going to ask, do you tend more to draw digitally these days now that the technology has come so far, or do you still find yourself kind of pencil and paper? I force myself to draw pencil and paper to uh, keep in practice. I feel like that's important. Um, because it's, you're using different muscles. 
uh, digital is much, much more forgiving. When you're doing pencil and paper, I feel like you're kind of working without a net to a, <laughs> to a degree because, you know, you can, you can layer things in digital and you can uh, try this sketch. And if you don't like the way that arm is. Control Z, control Z. Move it and <laughs> things like that. Whereas, you know, uh, pencil, you just, you know, you've got it fully erase something and then redraw it. You know, it's, 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 um, a bit less more of a pain in the ass actually, but it's, <laughs> but it's a good, it's a good pain in the ass. It's like, yeah, you, I think it's important. Plus the fact that, um, you know, I, I still do commissions, not as often as I think people would like, because I get a little overwhelmed. Um, and when I do those, you know, people don't want it digital. They want an original artwork. So, you know, and and if people are asking for that, Absolutely. you want to be able to to give it to them and have it not look like shit. So <laughs> you could beat that, I guess, right? Um, yeah, and it's true what, what Chris <laughs> says. A lot of times, it depends on the on the writer for how it's approached. And I know when whenever Chris and I worked on Little Archie together, we had the benefit of uh, being in the office together, yep. so we could actually. It didn't necessarily have to be word for word. What I had sometimes we worked out the idea together. Yep. First, but we would plot it together, and then you know, if Chris had a good line. I put it in there. You know, I, couldn't, I would never turn down a good line, a uh, dialogue. So <laughs> sometimes you can collaborate. It depends on the artist, and a lot of times some of the best comics are when the the writers and the artists actually communicate with each other. Uh, the often it's just you know an artist is handed the script. So really well, that's means- actually what I was going to ask is if, you know, if it typically starts with the story, then that goes to the artist or vice versa. So you just kind of answered that. But I was definitely curious about that. I mean, and an editor starts- and each publisher handles it a little differently. Yeah. But Along I feel like those it, lines. And it always, and it's, I'm sorry. sorry, Chris, go ahead, please. I think it all comes out to like a level of trust. Like when you're first starting out and you don't know who you're working with, you know, you're going to do. You're going to, uh, I don't want to say over-prepare, but um, maybe as you become more comfortable with people, you know what you can count on that other person to do, to pick up, you know? So you, uh, when you're going in, you don't really know how the partnership is going to, to work. Or uh, so, so you, uh, you make sure that your share of it, you know, is as, as tight as possible. But then over time, you know, if you find out, oh, you know, he's, like Paul would say, he's, he's bringing something to this. Maybe I can, I, I don't have to be as tense about this. I can relax a little bit. I can, I can, it's, it's a trust issue. Yep. There it is. There's one of ours. Yeah. yeah. That's the first panel of a story that I wrote and Chris drew. And that little guy in the bushes is a little alien that kind of has like a brush for a head. So that's why he's able <laughs> to like, hide. It looks shrubs. like a Groot species. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, like a Groot species. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that being said, Paul, what is your approach to creative writing? How do you get yourself started when somebody hands you something? Like, uh, what is that process for creating a plot? It all depends. Like I said, it's it varies based on the editors and the publishers and the needs of what it is. You know, or it's different when it's an animation script. Uh, you know, I've done things where I've thrown plots at editors and then you confer with the editor and like, well, I like this part of it, but maybe this part can be this instead, or we could change this around. You know, you get the input from the editor and then you retool it. Um, You know, when I was doing uh, a lot of comic book work, a lot of times I was taking out a pencil and I was figuring out the panel layouts. Like I was like, all right, I want a longer panel here to start and a thin panel on the end. Is this going to be three tiers, four tiers? You know, how many rows, you know, is there going to be a full page spread somewhere? Uh, you know, all that type of stuff. I would kind of like, but and, and if, I didn't really save a lot of these, but if you saw them, you wouldn't be able to make heads or tails of them anyway. But but I knew what they meant when I was looking at them. And I would scribble in some lines of dialogue. Uh, there's a turtle story I wrote. That, so I was going to uh, say, Gary, what if we Gary just Fields focus on some turtle stuff? That. Yeah, that's one that uh, uh, an artist named Gary Fields uh, who's done a whole bunch of comic stuff, and I think he worked for Nickelodeon for a while. Uh, he did the art on that one. Um, that was an early turtle story. The whole turtle thing is kind of interesting because um, 
I'll let Chris tell, you know, how he was brought in because I don't quite remember how he was brought into the turtle thing. Um, I don't know if don't I was dive involved. right in. I don't remember. But, right but okay. I, I know that, that one of them, and when I was at Archie, they had me wearing like 50 different hats. So, you know, it was like whatever they, they couldn't identify, let's have Paul do it. You know, so, so it's like, because, oh, well. because, and I'm going to go back to what I said before. Oh, no. Because you can pull water out of a stone. Because like to got Paul do it because they know it's going to get done. I'm telling you, <laughs> big fan. Well, the guy to go to. That, that, <laughs> yeah, that so was another one of my the questions. Was they, you know, the the managing editor was busy with all the Archie freelancers and keeping track of all those books, and you know they didn't want to have to be bothered with dealing with the people at Mirage Studios who were the owners of the Turtles, who were basically they were packaging the books, so. The guys who created it, uh, Eastman and Laird, they were doing their black and white original version of this comic. And Archie had the color version, which was mm. aged down for kids. It was supposed yep. to be like for kids watching the cartoon show yep. uh, weekday afternoons. And so, but, but Mirage still had the editorial control over it, at least in those first years. Um, and oh, throughout. Yeah. Well, yeah, just towards the end when they, when they did those, when there was kind of that weirdness with Forever War, which we'll get to. Which um, we'll get to. Yeah, but um, yeah, so they needed somebody on staff who could be like a liaison, almost be like, uh, you know, uh, uh, an assistant editor to the guys at Mirage. So I, in effect, became an uncredited assistant editor to this guy, Steve Murphy, who was handling all that stuff. And Steve, Steve was great. And um, Steve was you know, great. He had a lot of passion. And uh, he was also writing a lot of the scripts under a pen name. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so I was that guy. And uh, the way I ended up with Turtles, I think I just started with those, that one story you showed there that Gary Fields drew. I started, I just decided I wanted to try writing a script. Now that's fancy mm -hmm. high. That's the second story in that same issue. Sorry, uh, I didn't mean to jump ahead. A little of a bolt <laughs> that's that I created. Yeah. That's that mole character head rush that I created. But but I went to Steve at one point with um, one of those scripts. I said, I'd love to you know, write one of the specials. And he liked the script. And then I came up with this one you see on the screen now, uh, oh. or you did see a moment ago. And, um, <laughs> and that also- Keep up, Paul, that, keep up. <laughs> that also was part of the same special. But in the interim, I had a buddy uh, named Dan Necrosis, who I had met mm. at the DC Comics Christmas party. And we had gotten chummy and we just started collaborating on stuff. And he's like, I always had this idea for like some environmental heroes. You want to uh, create it with me? Yeah. So we sat down and we brainstormed it out and, and then we, we trademark, we copyrighted it rather. And we um, pitched it to Archie and they rejected it. So at this point, I already have a good relationship with Steve Murphy at Mirage. So I, I noticed Oh, Steve's part, starting to put some environmental messages into Turtles comics. Maybe he'll like this, you know. So throw it over to Steve, and he's like, yeah, this is great, you know. And then the next thing you know, we're over in Northampton, Massachusetts, getting, you know, the blessing of, uh, of I think, Laird. I think Peter yeah. Laird, we met him, I think. Uh, I don't know where Kevin Eastman was at the time. But we went over there and got their blessing, and then we ended up with the special. And I think ultimately the special ended up coming out before – those stories. And that's another thing about comics. Sometimes you, you don't know the order if something's going to come out. You know, I wrote those other stories before this, but this actually came out before the stories I wrote. Now, what you're looking at here is actually uh, a collaboration uh, between myself, uh, Dan Necrosis, uh, my collaborator, who, who sadly passed a couple of years ago, uh, and the co-creator of Conservation Corps, and, and um, and Chris is also in this issue, um, not on this particular page, but in the the issue, uh, the full length issue. Anywhere you see the turtles, that's Chris. Uh, and anywhere you see the conservation corps, that's Dan. And I forget how the backgrounds and all that were were uh, hashed out. But uh, and I know we had John D'Agostino inking on that. The great John, uh, oh, John yeah. D'Agostino. And. Um, yeah, so you can see that's, you know, it's an unusual thing to have uh, 
the characters that you just kind of created on a whim get to you know debut alongside the the sheriff so cool. we were thrown <laughs> yeah. with it. and it led to a mini series but we're not here to talk about conservation Corps. we're here more to talk about the turtles yeah. and uh we're here to talk about that's, yeah, that's how and, and i don't that like goes. i said like chris was already i don't remember how chris you started doing turtles or when I started doing it because uh, Ken Matroni was doing the. Yeah, the Ken. He was the regular artist. And um, I was super hungry, like I said, to, to be doing art, like to be drawing comics. And, um, you know, uh, I was not. Archie, I could get like a little drip here and there, but it would have to be um, like in my spare time you know, and things like that. So um, Murph again gave me a spec strip to do, or not really a spec strip, they maybe paid me for it, but, um, and I was incredibly motivated to do it as fast as I could to show him that I could. So I cranked it out. I mean, I basically went home and just worked, uh, 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 went home every day after work and just worked on that and got it as, 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 as fast as I could. And he was uh, real happy with it. And then um, when uh, Ken Matroni had had enough of the grind of doing the monthly strip murph asked if i would like to pick it up and i was like hells yeah um it meant quitting the full-time job my first full-time job and um trusting that i could support myself essentially as a freelancer a freelancer with like you know one client because i wasn't really an employee of Mirage or Archie at that point. I was I was gonna be a, a contractor. Um freelance. Yeah, freelancing. Um, but you know, Murph said, no, no, I can give you enough. And then um for a little while there the ride was great because it wasn't just the book, it was doing a lot of the uh, uh art for promotional materials and, and licensed stuff and lunch boxes and t shirts and sleeping bags and things. So um mm-hmm. it was good. It was a good run until, you know, it wasn't but I probably had a few of those <laughs> items. The interesting thing that happened with with Chris and uh, and Steve Murphy on that run of Turtles was w- in the days when uh, Ken Matroni was doing it. You know, Ken's background was animation, and he was yes. doing a lot of animation work too, and comic work. You know, and and you know that's I can understand and storyboard work. He, uh, Ken yeah, actually, was getting, uh, you know, it was a grind storyboard for Pixar, so he had to let go of some of it. But at, when it was in that cartoony way. The stories were also a little um, younger in their leanings. Yep. And then as Chris and Steve Murphy started collaborating, you know, Steve writing the stories and Chris doing the art, they it started taking on its own form and it aged up a bit. And yes. it gained this huge following. And it's an interesting trajectory because that whole thing ended up deja vu all over again with Sonic the Hedgehog. Because Sonic started out the exact same way, very cartoony for the kids, and ultimately it became these very layered, nuanced stories. And the fandom was going nuts over it because they were so uh, invested yeah. and engaged in all That's these characters. Yeah, There's see, a character cool. on that cover that Chris created. Chris will tell you. No, about. no, no, I didn't. You didn't, I didn't create, create Ninjar? Ninjar. Actually, no, I, I you didn't. did. No. Um, uh, I think, well, Murph created Ninjar, but I didn't um, even create. I almost uh, exclusively, I was like one of the only people to, to draw her. But um, when when she was int- introduced into the book, uh, Murph sent me over a sketch of the character. This is this character we want to introduce in. And John is like, oh, she, she's awesome. She's badass. But no, I wish I wish I could take credit for creating oh, her. Wow. A lot I of never people, knew that. Who, do you a know lot of people think that I did. Um, and uh, but I I I. I I cannot take credit. Uh, okay. No, no. I I would. I did her first wow. appearance in the book, but it was and I. I'm blanking on on who it was that came up with her look, but it was somebody at uh, at Mirage. Oh, that, cool. Yeah, never knew that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It became it um became actually so, so much part of you because of you doing it all the time. Yeah, and that Just people assumed you, you were know, the would nor- naturally assume that. You were, you know, one of the creators of it, like I did. Yeah, and what's 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 interesting if you if you do your little deep dive into the internet, which I have, um, 
uh, Ninjara was uh, part of the pitch to spin off the uh, Mutanimals as their own cartoon show. And um, her her look for the cartoon was not not good. <laughs> very very pink. Oh. Very yeah. I, I oh. I'm yeah. They would they yeah, they would have ruined my girl. But yeah, I I feel um uh a degree of possessive towards Ninjara that's not earned from actually creating her. But you know, I mean, I. Yeah, she's very well. Aesthetically, you yeah. kind of had a lot to do with it, probably since you drew her so much. And yes, yes, right. and I feel like I breathed like a lot of life into her, and I gave her absolutely a lot of her personality. Um, uh, but no, I did not create the character. Well, there we go. I wish I, wish I wish I could lay claim to that. A little pop culture yeah. knowledge for some of y'all. <laughs> Thanks, Wikipedia. <laughs> yep. If that's on Wikipedia, somebody edit that stat. I don't want that. that. Yeah. I just kind of had a basic question: who Who is your favorite turtle? Why? And and when drawing them, is it the same drawing all four, or is it definitely that? Do you you know feel the difference? So they look the same when I draw right. them; they all look the same. Um, but uh, I actually draw them um, with different, holding themselves a little bit differently. Their posture, uh, uh, I guess. Their uh-huh. posturing's a little bit, you know. Um, I don't have a favorite because mm. they are all, to me, um, different uh, uh, aspects of a well-rounded personality. Uh, okay, I was thinking the same. Yeah. Yeah, and, makes um, sense. And you know, so uh, uh, I, it's you know, you've got Raphael, who's like you're more of your angry. Uh, hot headed, hot headed, run ahead, and you know Leo. I love you know the the maturity and the leadership quality, and but Mike keeps things a little bit light, and then uh, Don, you know, the, keeping things very rational and all this. Like all four of them work so well together as a team, and the team is you know creates this this great unit. And I don't, I can't have a favorite from that. But I always have a cognizant. favorite. Go What's ahead. You cognizant. I'll just say, I'm always cognizant, cognizant of, of, of who it is that uh, needs to be doing what because they're going to be based on their personality. They're going to be carrying themselves a little bit differently. Right. So, <laughs> aside from your iterations, what would you say is your favorite? You two aside ball. from mine. Yeah. Uh, because I, mean, I actually did a project in school. Where we had like. When we went to Otis, there was a, a history of toy class, and I did like a, our final paper, final presentation was, you know, we pick something, pick a subject, and did a deep dive into it. And I went with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and like a variety of its iterations because, again, there's so many. But it, it was a cool experience to know where they came from, where they started, and just know all about it. And, you know, I don't know, I guess for me, I just always fell in love with, the, like, the 90s version, even before the the, the layer. The, I, of course, the movie, but that's I'm, – I'm just curious to see what – Yeah. I love, and I love speaking of the suits. movie, they're supposed to be developing a new one soon, but, you know, they've been developing some here and there in the past. I, I did some more Teenage Mutant A new live action? Turtle. I don't know if it's live action. Uh, I think it, Seth Rogen – It Rogen, better be. <laughs> I think it still might be CG, but it's going to be a little bit on a darker edge. I think Nickelodeon's nice. producing it. So well, Nickelodeon. Nickelodeon owns it now. They own the yeah. Okay. Um yeah, I mean, well the, your your um your presentation uh, or project that you did for your class is why we're here today. Oh. Ah. Because Eddie was Eddie was showing uh his parts of it. From that. And I'm like, oh, yeah. that's cool. You know, if you guys want to do a podcast around it, you know, maybe we can talk about our experiences with, with turtles. But um, I'll tell you that. Well, first what about movie, you, Paul? That that, that first um, uh, turtles movie. Um, you know, like I said, I wore tons of hats at Archie, so I was also like involved in like marketing and promotion, and you know, I would be involved with like, distributors and comic shops and for the movie. Stuff. And and so I was always like I always had one foot in editorial and one foot in in marketing. And when they put out that first uh, movie adaptation, Ooh. that thing sold crazy numbers. It it was in the hundreds of thousands. Um, yeah. 
you know, maybe if they ever figure out the numbers, it might even be in the, the top 10 of the whole 1990s. Because with Archie, they didn't just do like comic shops. They did newsstand distribution. So it, every 7-Eleven, every Walmart, mom and pops, you know, it was all this other stuff. And those uh, had higher circulations always than the, the comic shops did back in the 90s. Uh, and I just remember that. I remember the circulation guy telling me that I don't remember the number now, but it was like a crazy off the chart six figure number that that uh, that's how much total mania was had taken over. Yeah, when I, I, really came out. It was like the peak. I still it, remember. You know? I still remember. Um, you know, after school, you'd come home and watch Ninja Turtles, Tailspin, Ducktales, Tailspin, oh, Rescue yes, Rangers. Yeah, yeah. You know, and. <laughs> So I watched Ninja Turtles religiously, and then when I came home from school, they placed that first trailer on the first commercial break of the Ninja Turtles. I think Turtles. I just saw it for the first I time. I ran day. around the house screaming, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was so I ecstatic. Say, during, the- when it was coming out, we were in the office. We were seeing, like, the photos and things, and we were like, this looks badass. This- <laughs> Yo, Jim Henson, we give, give them all. They I mean, they took on. care of that man. That was yeah. No, I mean, it, hasn't yeah, it been had top. a nice dark edge to it. Oh, that's you know, what I was and say I remember next. being. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, the CG, the the fact this whole the CG thing is like I understand it, and you know some people don't like, but I've seen some trailers for some CG stuff that has been created just by you know digital artists, and man, they they're able to replicate the look of those Jim Henson suits in, in, in 3d. And it looks, I mean, it looks flaw. Like if, if I any would direction love to see that, I need that to direction is what they need to go with. Cause they it's need to have the heart too, you know? So I'll give you two things that I'm thinking in my head. Like there's a, a movie from the eighties, John Carpenter remade the thing, right? <sighs> Great yes. science fiction, horror movie. And mm-hmm. I watched that and I still haven't seen, horror effects that top it's scary it that, is super those effects scary. and they're yeah. all practical they're all practical yeah those, you know rig. alien as well i'll it's even do you one better the uh and then, great. Then, and then as far as the um um uh you know puppets versus cg i mean you watch empire strikes back and that yoda is really alive and mm. has a lot of heart and emotion in it and when I see I'm him again in Attack of the Clones, and he's now he's CG, it's I tell it's I not the same. The it's, it's not, not the same. same. Yeah, it's the good. other. It's really the good, other one. Not, there's something about it that's they, they have to get the organic. They got to figure that out in CG. I think the other but one getting, I always go back to is the skeleton scene from Jason and the Argonauts by Ray Harryhausen. Oh, yeah. oh, yes. The way it moved, you just can't do that with CGI. It's too smooth, and the that kind of clunky clackety movement from that movie. It's like, they're terrifying looking in that stop motion animation style. Yeah. And I, as I recall, to... I think that when they did um, uh, Mars attacks, uh, they specifically yes. wanted the CG to, to, to skip a few frames so that it would uh, uh, give Interesting. you that same effect. That's actually, that's, but... cor- that's correct. They absolutely did that. They wanted it to look like that old, Jason the Argonauts look, and that's how yep. they achieved ah. it. Uh, so but I'm looking this done, up but I, I don't know if you're think... aware of this, Paul, uh, and everybody else, that you were talking about the thing, and yeah. I'm gonna go down a whole, a whole rabbit Bang hole. Rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. So when they redid when they did the thing sequel slash prequel, um, yeah. recently, which uh, I never saw. Which, which I I didn't I, I didn't hate. That. Yeah. I didn't hate it. It was on like it's, Hulu or what was it it's on not, Hulu or one of those streaming services, yeah. right? Okay. It's not great, but I like a lot it of things dark that enough. aren't great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they were originally going to do a lot of the uh, effects in that. There it is. Harbor Judah. Uh, they were going to originally do a lot of the effects in that with wet puppets, which is mm. what we like to call. Um, and uh, then they decided to go CGI. But the company that had put a whole bunch of work into doing the the practical effects for that then took a lot That's of what they end. had done for that and made uh, a little nothing movie called Harbinger Down, which is uh, a a wet puppet 
smorgasbord and it's wonderful and you should watch it and it stars Lance Henriksen so how bad could it be? Harbinger Down (laughs) What was that name again? Say it again Harbinger Down 2015 I recommend it I recommend This is from Jason and the Argonauts Pop some corn tonight and throw in Harbinger Down and you will not be disappointed And there you go and then then one of the great things I'll just say I'll I'll, I'll, uh, just say something that's uh, in our personal lives uh, looking at this frame of Jason and the Argonauts, because uh, when when um, I was still working at Archie and Chris was uh, freelancing, you know, he would invite me over from time to time. I had to pass through his town anyway, and he introduced me to this great show. And you can find copies of it on YouTube. That's so cool. It was, it was called the Amazing Video Show or something like that, right, Chris? It was the Incredibly Strange Film Show. Yes, Incredibly Strange Film yes, Show. Yes, we used to watch it and- all the time. Yeah, and then we used to watch that. He used to tape them, and I'd come over and we'd watch them. And they did a whole episode on Sam Raimi. And, of course, if you watch Army of Darkness, which was the third yep. of the Evil Dead movies. Oh, my God. I remember how excited that's we That's a were tribute to these Jason <laughs> the Argonauts yes. films. <laughs> so I just had to share that. But, One of my uh, favorite movies of all time, Army of Darkness. Oh, yeah. It's great. Yeah. It's groovy. Well, we could do... Like I don't know how long you guys want to stay, but I we could do you guys five hours on old sci-fi movies and yeah. not talk about. Well, I lost all <laughs> audio. <laughs> uh, question for Chris: Please. What are your? I'm an I'm an illustrator too. I'm actually working on a comic book with a friend right now that we're don't gonna, do it. Um, that we're going to publish <laughs> and pitch to Image and maybe Dark Horse and stuff. But uh, what are your top influences as far as illustrators go in the comic book world like for me mcfarlane reign supreme greg capullo what are some of your comic book artist favorites that inspired you to do this um hmm. i mean very good question say again what was that say a good question good question it's a very good question and one that I had not uh, fully prepared myself. And we came up address. a little earlier, you know, so, so you know, people that were inspiring us would have been people we saw when we were kids in the yeah. 70s I mean, and 80s. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting is that I thought about this in the past. And yeah. if, I, if I said, like, I, this was my influence, uh, a lot of times, like, for instance, um, well, one of our teachers at school was Will Eisner, and he was incredibly influential as far as um, wow how, how to um, uh, uh, communicate a story and tell a story. But if I master about, of like, sequential art, absolutely yes, master. And he was he was amazing at t- t- teaching you how to communicate with non-verbally what's happening and and the importance of of flowing the 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 action from panel to panel it was um uh, uh comics and sequential art by will eisner is an essential i have book. it yep. yeah um john ramita jr i liked his he, his stuff was was huge for me and it's like you could look at it and go like i'll sit here and 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 name people that like uh, an influence is 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 hard to say because i would try to get my stuff to 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 ape theirs or mimic theirs but i would always fall short because my stuff was everybody always talked about how i bought more of an edge to the turtles but it was still very cutesy I mean, like not as dark as i would like to go but i seem to be hitting like a cutesy wall as far as the stuff that i do i mean i could just cover things with blood and it would be adorable blood so i just don't really have a problem <laughs> but, you, but you know what you when you started <laughs> um doing turtles that kind of became a thing anyway because yep. you look at gargoyles disney's gargoyles yep you know it's yep. very you can look you put that next to a chris allen turtles comic and you can see the influence and then when they did batman animated in the early 90s yep they yep, were the batman they, they were like stuff. combining oh. combining the edge with uh something that was still aesthetically mainstream enough but with an edge which is kind of a uh, cool thing. So you were like on the cusp of that. I am on the cusp. <laughs> uh, you talk about the Batman animated, the Batman animated uh, comic series that they came out was uh, Mike Parabek was the artist on that for a while. Parabek. Yeah, and he was. I I used to see Mike Parabek stuff and go like, oh, I need to. I, I want to do that. Paul Smith, Paul Smith stuff on the X Men. 
in the 90s too. It's all like super, super crisp and clean and not a lot of, and, and they were at the time doing real minimal amount of, of ink work when the big trend was, you know, how much cross-hatching can ink. squeeze onto a page. Uh, but I always liked the economy of line. Like, what can you do with with less ink? With, you know, I was always a big fan of that. Oh, yeah. This is Turtles 3. My big, this is, believe it or not, one of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm so jazzed that I got to do. I got to do a comic, a film adaptation of what everybody regards as the worst Turtles movie. But I don't care. I love it. <laughs> I I thought the second one was worse than this one. I actually kind of enjoyed okay. this one. Okay, I, I thought the I, Star I, I Trek V of the Turtles franchise. The, <laughs> the first one was a wonderful I piece match. of art. Uh, I had just the right enough edge. The second one, it was a little cheesier, but it had really great martial arts in it. Really awesome martial Everybody. arts. And number three, it was and like had Toka and Razar. Those guys yeah, were awesome. Was, and Vanilla Ice. Come on, Come on. Come on. Come on. No, but the third one, it was fun. It was like it was out there fantasy, but it was a fun movie. I think I saw the third one more than I did the second one. I saw it more times. My brother's band is in that comic book, by the way, because at one point. Casey goes to like some nightclub and I put my brother's band in the background and he's so <laughs> nice. That's, that's <laughs> awesome. What kind of band was your brother in? A terrible, terrible band. <laughs> <laughs> and Not he metal killing. <laughs> <laughs> I was in a death metal band for like 10 years, so I always gotta ask. It was it was metal. It was it okay. was metal, and I'm not a metalhead. The name of the band was Virgin Sacrifice, and it was practically a parody band. Um. <laughs> oh, yeah, look at that. That's there you go. There you go. Yeah, that's not a Saturday morning kids show anymore. Yeah, that's that's definitely what it needs to go back to. to it definitely has a different yeah. feel. So I mean, this you is can uh, feel the the grit the and and the rawness of it. Yeah. So Paul can probably speak to more of this because I actually I'm curious um, because I never zoom in uh, on that. Uh, I never spent a lot of time um, on what the behind the scenes stuff was. But Paul, you said that near the end, um, Archie had more editorial control or. Yeah, I don't know what happened. I don't know the details. And all I do is I have vague memories. And then what I read online, but I do remember there was some move. You guys were going to do that story arc, the Forever War. Yep. And Archie decided not to move forward with it. And yeah. quickly, and quickly, other stuff had to take its place, and then they put out a new miniseries. And yeah. um, you know, when you read it, so online, I don't think Archie I mean, ever had editorial control of mine and read through it. I don't know how much of what's online is true or not, but apparently there was just a, uh, I don't know, maybe they were looking at numbers and they thought it wasn't working anymore. Who knows? You never know what that could have been. That yeah. I think what was going on was so. Um, Mirage had editorial control over what would appear in the book. Um, but, and Archie just had the, 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 the job of publishing it, the rights to publish it. And um, I think that a lot of the times we would do things that maybe Archie wasn't always comfortable with. Um, so Archie wasn't entirely comfortable with it sometimes. Mirage didn't care. Um, because Murph and I always were kind of the redheaded stepchildren of the Mirage group. Um, we, the, uh, East Middle Air were much more interested in their black and white book. And, um, what was his name? Uh, Paul Fred, um, that was, in, that was pushing the toy stuff. Um, the toys? Yeah, the, the guy at Mirage that was, that, Mirage. that was like. Oh, a, yeah, yeah. And I forget his last name. Right. I remember Mark Friedman. And, the guy that got right. him to playmates, I, I think. Mark Freeman, was yeah. a licensing agent. And then there was, yeah, there was another guy, and I can't for life. Was... Yeah. I always kind of felt that Eastman and Laird were uh, a little, and I could be wrong about this. So, like, this isn't any kind of scoop, you know, wrong, like, but I always kind of got the feeling that Eastman and Laird were kind of a little embarrassed about the kitty turtles. 
even though that's what made them so much money. money. Um, that, but, the, but their, but for them, the turtles were always like the black and white comic, the, 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 their gritty, their boys. And, um, you know, so the things that Murph and I were doing were like, you know, you guys just go over there and, you know, have your fun and with your colors. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and we're not going to bother you because we don't mm. care. And so really for almost the entire run, Murph and I were like unsupervised children. We were, we could pretty much do whatever we wanted because Archie had to publish it. And uh, exactly. there wasn't even anybody, I think, at Mirage that would listen if Archie was complaining because they just didn't care. Am I, am I wrong, Paul? That was yeah, always my feeling. It, it was definitely a, a free, uh, it was a free reign for you and, and Murph. For quite a while, I know that much, right? And I think it was for, that, I, for those reasons because Eastman so, Lawyer were involved in their own version of it, and Archie was just looking for it to make money for them. And so, yeah. for and a so long time, it, nobody it was, was paying attention. <laughs> yeah, so it might have been where if the numbers kind of got down to the point where maybe the numbers didn't fall, or maybe if the numbers were, um, maybe they got to the point where Archie could justify. And I'm like, I'm speculating. Archie could justify getting rid of it because they probably chafed at their lack of control. And that uh, until things started tapering off a little bit, they couldn't really, it's like, oh, it sucks that we don't have control, but we're making so much money on this. We can't really pull the plug, but maybe like the contract came around again and they're like, okay, good. Here's our opportunity to get this annoying thing out from under us. And about that time, uh, uh, that wasn't long before, uh, they were getting a hold of Sonic and they right. figured like we could, we could, we could maybe take what's happening with the turtles with Sonic and not have all the turtles headaches, you know, and make this, make the turtles money with Sonic. And you know what? They weren't wrong. Yeah. I ended up, Sonic ended, Sonic up, ended up becoming the, uh, yeah, it was like, um, I remember the same thing happened when I worked for Mattel twice, but we had lost, um, Sesame street license. To Hasbro, and then um, and then the, Thomas the Train came. You know, originally Mattel, it was just fucking a Thomas, man. And Thomas, Thomas. like Thomas, just <laughs> I watched up. Thomas. It's like there was there was no like break in sales because whatever was lost from losing Sesame Street, Thomas picked it up. Thomas picked right it's up. It's kind yeah, of the same thing was... happened with Turtles and and Sonic, Sonic. and Archie. Um, you yep. know, it's the same thing and. Um, but yeah, so but you guys, so talk about like you guys had planned out this story arc, right? For Forever War. Yes. Do you want to? Well, we take it from saw here, Forever War how it didn't happen, but then how it how uh, later down the road. So the happen, writing was, was on the wall. Happen, and now it is happening. I think the writing was on the wall that yeah. um, that Turtles was going to go, and we thought, okay, if it's going to go, if it's going to if they're going to pull the plug on us, let's go out like. Let's go out big. So um, Murph plotted out like a five issue wrap up the whole series. And we we're going to bring back all the, it was going to be in like the, the ye old um, time travel dystopian alternative timeline, Shredder wins, blah, blah, blah. You know, we've seen, we've, we've danced this dance before. Um, and we, we did the covers uh based on on the descriptions and um i think he even solicited them because it's coming and then i drew the we pencil inked and lettered the first issue and then archie said now we're canceling the book and um murph called and told me this i love this story uh murph called and told me um they're pulling the plug they're willing to pay you for whatever you can finish by the end of the week. And I think I had penciled five pages. So I penciled the rest of that book in like four days. It looks like garbage. And I, <laughs> and I still have uh, uh, a bunch of those pages. I, I made copies and sent them to Murph. And it's like, Murph said, I don't care what they look like. Pencil the pages, send them to me. They'll pay you for them. I'm like, okay, you know, <laughs> But that was it. That was that was the end of of, of the series and and the Forever years, War. That years, sounds like, familiar. Yeah, 
kids would be, um, the, the kids who were reading it then um, got into college and I, my emails would start pinging. And it's like, you know, people hunted us down and were like, whatever happened with the, with the forever war, Are you guys going to finish it. It was, this, it was always this thing. It was like, you would find it on um, lost media websites too. It was like this Holy grail for people. And I would always say, you know, I'd love to do it, but I'm not going to do it by myself. Um, I always wanted to do it with Murph. I always thought that that would be proper. Um, and then I think IDW started making noise or forgive me. I don't know. The, yeah. I because at this story. point, at this point in the story that they didn't just cancel that story that Chris and Murph were working on, but then they also just, like I said, they did some kind of weird other mini series with other writers and artists. And then they pulled the plug all together. So it at that point, she didn't have Turtles anymore, and it had gone over to IDW, just so people know the chronology of when Chris right. mentions IDW. But at that point, IDW had the publishing rights to yeah. uh, the, the, the more, you know, kid version of Turtles. It wasn't a miniseries. It was that um, Murph had a, a couple standalone um, issues. Yeah. That, well, that, that came that, first. That had... right. And then Archie did some other series without you guys. And, and I, I remember it. I remember Not that I recall, but I, but I don't remember what it was. It, it was inconsequential, but yeah. Um, and then I think uh, there was some talk about let's let's finish the. I think Murph told me that they were in talks to let's finally finish the Forever War when it was at IDW. I think it was for anniversary thing. Um, and then just when we were about to do that, the sale to Nickelodeon went through, and that stopped mm. everything. And then um, there's an ad and, for that too. Yeah, there's an ad you can find online for the IDW Forever War five issue series that never was. Yep, yep, yeah. It, it came. It came so close. Came so close. <laughs> Twice. I saw something the other day about like some TMNT. Like they did a whole. I, it was in essence another presentation about like the movies that they had made. And that Forever War sounds like what would have been the fourth movie. I that sounds so familiar. Like oh my I, god, that fourth movie they were developing. I think it like they tried it two or three times and they got close and they got called off a number of times. I actually really like the quote unquote fourth TMNT CGI uh, one. The two thousand seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I and actually went. I Man, went to it, and that's a continuation the... of the other three because you'll notice yeah. that it, when it ends, they've got the time scepter from three and all <laughs> the, the the stuff from the all your films are in there. I went to school with with the director's daughter. She sat right beside me, Andy Monroe. Monroe. I don't know. It's, to me, it kind of felt like a cross between the Incredible Hulk CGI and Transformers. Like they made them like larger than life. Wait, are you talking and... about you talking no, no, about that's the, Michael... the new? I'm talking about the, that's the, the Michael Bay minutes. one. Oh, okay. right. No, we're talking, talking about, about the 07. Not... Oh, yeah, okay. in 07. It, it was yeah. A, yeah. a cartoon on Nickelodeon. No, it came no. out in theaters. No, 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 no. Oh, oh, I know what you're yeah. talking about. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Where oh, Leo yeah, comes right, back yeah, from, like, feature, yeah, right Leo now. comes back from his his vision quest or something, and then he and he Raph and Raph have that fight. Has like on armor the, and yeah. yeah, I like that one. That one's good. That one felt like that the, wasn't, the, wasn't the old bad. One. Yeah, didn't Patrick Stewart voice the villain in that? I'm pretty sure. Anyway, like I said, we could talk for old movies. Like, yeah, I might have much to, more. I might have to watch that for five again. hours. Anything else? <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Mike, okay. I found out. Carpenter out. Down and TMNT 2007. That's what you're doing tonight. You're not getting any sleep. <laughs> um, but well, anyway, we're, we're... the story about the Forever War, so they Nickelodeon and then pulled the plug. So um, there was no Turtles, as far as I'm concerned, you know, uh, for years. And then um, I got contacted by a gentleman in Russia named Arseny Dubikov. And he uh, somehow, I don't know, um, had the rights to d be reprinting the old uh, uh, TMT Adventures books in the Soviet Union, uh, in the former Soviet Union, sorry, Russia, and wanted to know if I wanted to do new covers. And um, I'm like, you know, hell yeah, yeah, sure. Like, rubles as good as dollars, I'll do it. And um, uh, again, 
he's a great guy. I got nothing bad to say about Arsini. I'm hoping that he's not been be, going to be drafted soon. Um, and again, talking to him, it's like, uh, whatever happened with the Forever War? And I'm like, dude, I, I, I can't tell you. And I think, I think it's dead now. He said. So what he decided he wanted to do was crowdfund oh, and man. create the unauthorized five issue series. And what he wants to do then is once it's finished, he wants to say to go to the American publishers and say, look, it's it's done done now. Will you please publish it? It's right here. And I'm like, Uh yeah, let's do it. So over the, um, uh, over the past way too long, um, I've been doing that in my spare time and I just finished my portion of it. Um, Arsini is, uh, uh, I think Andrew Modine, um, who also worked on the the turtles back in the day, um, uh, did the script for it. We got Murph's blessing. Murph didn't want to be involved in the project. Um, I gotta say, in a, in a way that I'm not entirely clear in the details of, Murph has some residual bitterness towards the way his relationship uh, ended with the turtles. So he didn't really want to be a part of it. Um, but he said, I'm sure you guys would do a fine job, you know, you know, Godspeed. And I'm like, okay, wow. yeah, sucks, That's but so... oh well. Um, and uh, yeah, so I just finished it. And um, hopefully in the next few months. Um, That's an Odd Frog uh, podcast preview. exclusive. Exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Chris so you can Thursday. you can you can get your copy if you go to um, Chris Allen Doodles uh, dot com. I have uh, a page there that has links to uh, where you can um, uh, order it off of. Our, we'll put a link to your website our in our show notes as well. Oh crap! I guess I better update it <laughs> and make sure that it's not all full of broken links. <laughs> <laughs> My go damn. <laughs> uh, I've got oh, a couple, yes. couple more quick questions, and then I think Mikey has some, some uh, kind of end of the podcast questions for you guys. Mikey, the producer. So <laughs> I'm wondering if each of you could give us an example of something that had to be in the TMNT books and stories as far as requested from mirage and then give us an example of something you couldn't put in the books because of mirage if you could um well what kept what (laughs) what kept popping into the books as requested for mirage was that um everybody at mirage who was there was working there was hoping to come up with the next uh popular character everybody wanted to to felt like the turtle these, these guys did it with the turtles we should be able to come up with our own so characters kept popping up that felt random sometimes but i know that it was it, it had to be like jim lawson or 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 ac farley or so I'm, I'm dropping names i don't know if they did this but i kind of got the feeling that the people who are in northampton as part of the mirage team were like pitching a character and they're like sure yeah throw it in the archie book <laughs> and yeah, well, that, well, that's what exactly what was happening. That that was kind yeah. of the impetus for one of the impetuses for me going to them with the conservation report. Yeah, you know, and, that, you was, know, the, that, that was the mutanimals. The mutanimals were or were featured in there. Yeah, and so. that's what and that's Mirage had an open door policy for all the yes. creators. Like they were very generous towards the creators. And in fact, um, yes, you know, Ryan Brown especially was able to get a few things off the ground. Ryan Brown. Yep. You know, uh, you know, and uh, they were very, Ace and Lair were great like that. They they were very yep. much, um, you know, pay it forward. Oh, see, yeah, I just oh, yeah. Paul, that, Paul just that was the ad yep. when when IDW was thinking of doing it. I think that yep. was the ad. Yeah, uh, you see, on I the think you're right because that's before the this the 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 the, the one with Arsini. One eyed yeah. Raph. I I did that art. Yeah, see, that's they they mentioned and they that. The yeah. See, they were developing a movie. There's like maquettes of I think they were even going for the like Jim Henson look. There's like maquettes of what the uh, foam latex costumes would be. I want to see I mean, that. I got I got to send you the link to that. <laughs> Please do. It's like a whole like 40 minute deep dive into like the 
the uh, filmography of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, what would have been, what got canceled, what it's it's a cool it's a cool little watch. Yes, please. And, and I will, speaking I will devour of speaking that. of toys and Archie Turtles, I just found this out. NECA, N E C A, North yep. Eastern Collectibles Association, they're they're doing a whole bunch of turtles toys, but one they of the, one of the kind of offshoot lines is Archie Turtles. And yes, they have yes. a Slash, and they have a uh, a Man Ray in there. Yep. And um, I got to hear from me about some of my my characters. Well, um, <laughs> Mikey, if he's still here, I don't, there he is. Um, Can you guys hear me? We're going on. We're over an hour now, so I think um, Mikey had some wrap up questions for you guys. And yeah, then, let's uh, do some wrap ups. Yeah. Is it about is it you about know, old old movies? Because. I'm not about that. <laughs> we can have a whole <laughs> separate oh, podcast nice. on movies. For sure. Absolutely. Um, no, 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 you, you know, we talk about movies. First and movies. foremost, Paul, Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it's really fascinating the uh, artistic lives you guys have led and have made some amazing projects, and we appreciate it. Um, so we just want to kind of keep it light for the last couple of questions, and I'll start with you, Paul. Uh, First off, if you could be any comic book character or have a superpower, what would it be? I want to be Plastic Man. Yes, he I does want to be Plastic, plastic Man. <laughs> I love Plastic Man. <laughs> plastic man. Oh, how, how could you not want to be Plastic Man? You could change in any shape, do any kind of wacky thing. He's, his brain is... Um, uh, it's it's like um, no longer organic, so he's not susceptible to hypnotism or mind control. You know, it's just you can, you, there's no limits to how far you could stretch. I'm learning a lot about Plastic Man right now. I had no idea. He's very, he's very but cool. are you recyclable? <laughs> um, well, yeah. I mean, he regenerated himself once. So, okay. yeah. So, you're green. You're they, green. They, 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 <laughs> some villain froze him in a Justice League story. Might have been a Mark Wade story somebody wrote it Maybe that's funny, Mark. but um are you saying plastic them. man or elastic man plastic, plastic man. man elastic man <laughs> if you, oh my god if you look wow. on the bottom of his foot there's a little two <laughs> but yeah they, around it a, a villain froze him shattered him into billions of pieces deposited him on the ocean floor and then billions of years later he regenerated all the pieces back. wait mm. millions of years later that answer <laughs> Did he yeah, then have to go up. back in time? I will look it up. There was probably some kind of time travel involved. Yes. Okay. Well, as, as, as you know, uh, <laughs> we here at the Odd Frog Chop Shop are real big into toys and toy memories. So, uh, what is your favorite toy memory? My toy memory yeah. is, is again, oh. it's, uh, being a you know a, a geek out kid on on animation and comics. That there was when we were kids, or yeah, well, Chris too, because Chris is a year older than me, actually, so he remembers this. Um, <laughs> there were the Mego eight inch action figures of superheroes, mm. and they were cool. They had Superman, Batman, Spider Man, everybody. Yeah. You know, and, uh, they were like five point of articulation. Yep. Yeah, but they were cool. <laughs> No, 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 no. The Mego ones could, they weren't as good as the G.I. Joe's. The G.I. Joe's could do full yoga, but the, the Amigo mm -hmm. ones could could move. They yeah. could move, and, and originally they were <laughs> um, before they realized that they could streamline things and work with molds. Uh, they had originally they had like a Batman that was actually a Bruce Wayne head, yep, with a rubber cowl, yep, that you could take on and off, but it would always break. Oh. And then eventually they just made it into a molded head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but but the other side of the molding coin, which was the the low light of Mego, and I don't think they really thought about this <laughs> at the time. They had had a line of Planet of the Apes action figures. Oh, got it. And they had these these Planet of the Apes action figures. So then at some point, the superheroes line is still going on, and they're going to go, oh, we're going to add the Falcon from Marvel Comics. And the Falcon was, of course, you know, um, the African-American sidekick of Captain America in the 70s, maybe uh, a bit of a, at the time, maybe a little bit more token because it wasn't as common back then, uh, which is unfortunate as to those times, but more unfortunate than that 
was because the way the toy industry works, when you reuse parts, yep. they said, well, we have all these Planet of the Apes bodies, so they're already brown, mm. and they make the Falcon, but the Falcon has furry hands. Because <laughs> it's the Planet of the Apes so that they use. They so reuse them, they repurpose them, and it's so wrong. So wait, 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 wait. wait. Was that was, was it was it like fur. sculpted the sculpted fur? Yeah, sculpted yeah, fur. Sculpted in to the head. Oh my god. I, you know, I, I love that. Thank you, Paul. Pay for a whole bunch of new brown plastic. Right? I'm telling so, everybody I meet this story now. <laughs> can you believe it? It's like one of those things where you're like, well, they really should have thought about that. <laughs> they, they thought about their body. Okay. Well, Chris, uh, awesome. same question to you. Same questions to you. If uh, you could be any comic book character or if you could have any superpower, what or who would it be? Uh, well, a superpower, I don't know. I would just love to be able to fly. Uh, I, I would love that. Keep it simple. Yeah, keep it simple. I just want to fly. Yeah. Just like this. It, would be, <laughs> it would feel good. Um, I don't. I don't read a lot of comics, believe it or not. I don't really have an, uh, a strong opinion about what comic book character or comic character I would be. Um, I enjoy superpowers. I, I think that the 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 comics that I enjoy more than anything else right now are um, indie and web comics, um, uh, much more like slice of life type of things. Um, I gotta say, uh, the little the little kid you just met. Uh, has started reading the Babysitter Club, where we spent a lot of time in the YA graphic novels, and um, uh, uh, Renee Telgemeier's, uh stuff with the Babysitter Clubs and a lot of her um, uh, uh, autobiographical comics are great. And I don't know, want to go back to high school? Nice. <laughs> you should check out Doc mm -hmm. Holy Day by Odd Frog Entertainment and Sundown Entertainment Media Group. I will do that. <laughs> Uh, SFG. Right now. Uh, and then what is your favorite toy memory? Oh, well, right now it's Anthony Matt. It's Falcon's furry hands. That's going <laughs> to be. That's my new favorite. Um, my favorite toy memory actually didn't happen with me. It was when I got a call from a friend of mine who was working at Marvel. Uh, this was uh, when Rob Kramer was at Marvel, Paul. Okay. And he called me so excited. Because he met the man who invented Kung Fu Grip. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I said, this is actually <laughs> the closest I'm going to get to, to, to touching genius is the fact that I know you, that you met the guy who invented Kung Fu Grip. We, we were just, I just remember getting that call from him and he was so excited and us geeking out about the Kung Fu Grip guy. And all those. But um, as far as the, the toys are concerned, I also had so much of the Mego lines like Paul was, and I still have some of the Planet of the Apes ones. Um, I have some of the Star Trek ones still. I had so many toys that are worth so much money now that I would look at Ooh, them. On I think we all go, did. Yeah, I used to have that. Yeah, I used to have that. Um, oh, I'd be rich. <laughs> um, but uh, no, we wrecked toys when we were younger. I don't mm -hmm. really. Uh, we played hard with them. We had, if we had a superhero, we, I had the Superman Migos, and that Superman was going to earn his name. God damn it! Yeah, it was, my, he was flying uh, we everywhere. Got to, <laughs> we got to play with the Migos because my older uncles had had them, and they had moved on. But then we got the box of old hand-me-down Migos and the Marx toys with. Uh, uh, yeah, check this yeah. out. <laughs> Got it there, yeah, ready to go. The Marks Toys, Geronimo. Oh my God, I remember those. Yes, remember this? Yes, I do. These are from my mom and her sisters and my uncles when they were kids. This thing is so detailed. I remember. It's really pretty oh, shit. amazing. I, I can't remember. I, I can't believe I forgot about this until you just showed it to me because I had the Lone Ranger, and I remember yeah. his pistols. They had the Lone Ranger. The pistols and I mean, were the insanely detailed. Come come yeah. out of the of the cheese yes. and um there was a like a bowie knife that yes you could put in it and, and that horse is well fully articulated. articulated well this one's not oh okay i think um, it, and the it, other ones it, i have the the tails are all broken off but this one made it 
wasn't um, um, Silver? But this is from 1965. Wow. Yeah. Wasn't Silver articulated? I thought one of the horses I remember was. Silver. I remember there was like a later iteration of the ones Kelly just showed us that were branded for Lone Ranger. I remember Lone Ranger, Tonto, and Silver, and Scout. Yep. And early 1970s. And I think they were they were Marks, yeah? They were yeah, Marks, Marks toys. And um, These actually have like like metal pins in them and stuff. Oh, I don't yeah. know if you can yeah. see that. I remember but, they uh, had, I had. And there's like is, springs in here. This is such an early 70s toy. And I had this when it was like, it was um, a metal box, um, like almost like a briefcase shaped. And it would open up and lay flat. And you had, um, and it was, and when it laid flat, you had like wall, wall, wall. And then the flats, the flat piece that would fold and make the bottom of it and then wall 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 and there was a cape canaveral one and then you open it up and there would be like like a little space like like a uh the saturn five like a little mini rocket this is before the space shuttle and stuff and there would be astronauts and stuff there was a a, a fort apache one and um with cowboys and indians good guys bad guys whatever um <laughs> and that came with like a little guard tower like that you could clip onto the corners, and I, I had that, and I played the with. I played with that a lot. That is a favorite toy of mine. Um, yeah, it's a amigos for me. The other thing, <laughs> if I can make, name another toy because I've been listening um, uh, a lot to uh, a podcast called Unpacking Peanuts, where they're going through all the Peanuts comic strips from the beginning. Oh, really? And kind of talking about it's a brilliant podcast. And it made me think about, I used to have this, um, it was called the Snoopy Drive-In Theater. And uh, yes, you would put I the cartridge that. in the side and it was molded to look like a, you know, a screen. And Snoopy's watching from the top of his doghouse. So he said, he took his doghouse to drive in the car. And you turn the crank and you see the films. And uh, they, they branched out to do like Saturday morning Handle Bearer stuff, all these other characters. But what was cool about it was inside each cartridge was a Super 8 film. And so because you were controlling the speed of it with your crank, I realized, oh, I could I could see how animation is done yes. here. Mm-hmm. Yes. Just go in slow motion and look a frame at a time at these things. I did this. Was, I had the same it was thing. Just a, it, was, it was just for fun. It was like, oh, it's teaching me about animation. I had the same thing with the, uh, the Disney one. And I remember the, the clip yeah. was like the the. When they were the ghost, the ghost hunters, the ghost catchers. I had yeah. that one, and I remember like doing the same thing you did. When I would go do it a frame at a time, and just stare at a frame, and then stare at a frame, and I was blown away by that. Like, holy crap, somebody drew this. Look at, and then and you got the idea of the stretch and squash and stretch effects and stuff. And mm-hmm. Yeah, it was like yeah. that. And the Preston Blair comic was like an animation, uh, little oh, book. Yeah, yeah, yeah a little that's, animation. That's guys like classroom. us. That that that's what triggered us in our brains yeah you know it wasn't just you know there was plenty of kids who were probably just you know turning the crank and watching the stuff go and not giving it another thought but guys like us were like how did they do it how did they do how it, they do it? I, they I think it's so easy to forget that there wasn't youtube and stuff back then yeah. and i mean i'm a slight slightly bit younger than you guys but i remember trying to figure out the the mystery of of illustration for comic books and just like how did they do that do they do the backgrounds first do they do the character then the backgrounds and then i found how to draw comics the marvel way and mm-hmm. it was just game on that unlocked on. so that many mysteries for me yeah. yeah yeah and i don't know if you also remember about that same time was the marvel comics tryout book i don't remember that one um and it was, I actually got that. And it was, um, it had a script with some blank pages in it and you could pencil the pages and it had some, Interesting. Uh, some penciled pages. And that, that was all by cool. uh, uh, John Romita Jr. And then you could try inking them. Um, I, I want to say that it had black and white pages for coloring, but it had everything that you needed to uh, pitch yourself to Marvel. And I got that, and I'm like, I'm going to go work at Marvel now. Ha ha. And I, I did it because I was not good enough for Marvel. <laughs> I was good enough for the Damn. Turtles. Then. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, look it up. The Marvel Comics trial book. It's actually really awesome. Yeah, I remember when that came out. Yep. 
I might even, oh God, I have to go look through the piles of shit. I bet I might even have somewhere in my, you know what? If I am updating my website, I should, that would be a fun thing to put up. Put it on there. My, yeah. my, my, my attempts. And we'll try, try it. it. Yeah. You never <laughs> sent it to them? Yeah, of course Everybody I sent it did? to them. Oh, you did? Yeah, of course I did. I get did it. they send it back? I don't, even, <laughs> I don't think I heard anything. I sent copies. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, okay. I'm not going to give this up. This is gold. That's right. <laughs> so somewhere in the, my parents' attic is uh, notebooks with little doodles of Huckleberry Hound and Yogi Bear that I did when I was four or five. You know, that's my, uh, that's why, my start. Why do you trust your parents with that? Go get that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I should figure that out. All right, guys. Well, listen, thank you so much for coming on here. And uh, it just feels great to me that we can kind of get this down for history, too. Like your guys' inside story and little little part of Cause we're gonna die Turtles soon, yeah. history. <laughs> yeah, and oh, you're no. decrepit. So <laughs> yeah, we're pumping yeah. you into our gas tanks soon. You're yes. Into <laughs> thank you guys for being here, for sure. <laughs> thank you, thank guys. you so yeah. much. Thank you so really much. I really appreciate it, guys. It's Oh! Much rejoicing. <laughs> Round of applause. <laughs> oh, wait, before we go, if people want to find you guys, where can they find you on uh, on all the socials and the interwebs? Well, I mean, um, uh, 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 Chris Allen Doodles is my website, and there's links. There should be links on there for in- to Insta and um, pretty much Instagram. I've done that. That's the two things I go on. Um, but I'm not very good at self-promotion. That's another thing Paul has over me. <laughs> what about you, Paul? Where can people find you? Um, you know, I'm floating around all different places, but um, I think the, the main area right now for me is the blog that's tied into my book. Uh, the book I'm writing, Film History, is also something else I do. And um, Plug it. Plug it. This, yeah, this plug book, it, man. Uh, scared, the Scared Silly book is uh, reviews of classic comedy films where the comedians get mixed up in spooky situations. So, you know, I have a Gestalt and Frankenstein type stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, that blog is, uh, you know, it's long, but uh, bear with us for a second. It's one word, scared silly by Paul Castiglia dot blogspot.com. Do you have so a publisher, put it on. Uh, That's part of me. Do you have an agent or a publisher? I actually did recently talk to someone who wants to publish it. So it, Sweet. it awesome. may actually finally be um, coming out in the next couple of years, hopefully. Well, I mean, over the pandemic, my big thing was I wrote my first children's book and farmed it out to a bunch of agents and nobody cared. So I'm I'm interested if anybody knows any, any agents that are looking to represent. <laughs> I sent you the, the cover for it. Oh, yeah. It is. Yeah, those look great. He is. Those look great. You see our uh, good, buddy yeah. Joe. Hey, and we love you, frogs. You mentioned yep. Rob and, and another guy that we'll publish was hanging out with Joe Dater became a big um, New Yorker cartoonist. Yes. And he has a children's book out now. Yes. Uh, I think it's called Santa Claus Doesn't Need Your Help. Yes, that's true. <laughs> very Jeez. much Joe Stay Dater's in bed. title. But maybe, mm-hmm. um, you know, maybe um, Joe has some insight into that world. Uh, uh, Chris, no. I have reached out to him. Okay. There's the other one you He's, sent. The Chris. poison dart frog's problem is is that he is a poison dart frog, so can't be can't kissed. Be changed into a prince again because if you kiss him, you'll die. Interesting. So. There's, there's always a hitch. <laughs> there's always a hitch. Well, <laughs> listen, guys. Thank you so much for coming on once again. We'll make sure and put all your plugs and uh, information in the description. So. Um, thanks for joining us again, you guys, on this Odd Frog 112 Scale podcast. And Thank much thanks to Chris Allen and Paul Castiglia for coming on with us. I, I, so thank you so much. Make sure and like and subscribe, guys. Like and subscribe. Hit the notification bell. Button. And we'll meet you back on here next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to the Odd Frog Chop Shop podcast. This episode is brought to you by MLCVoice.com and OddFrogEntertainment.com. Theme music is Burlesque Heartache by RKVC. Please remember to rate and subscribe. Until next time, keep creating and keep playing.